to God. Well, tonight's our, our healing service, so we're going to teach along the lines of the subject. And when we do this, we'll do, along these lines, we're going to teach along the lines of either faith or healing. And, uh, you know, um, when you start teaching on faith, or you, you're, you're teaching on faith, you're going to cover ground over and over again. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh, I had faith library with Dad Hagen. You know, he, you know what scripture he used every single time we came together? Mark, 11, open your Bibles to the 11th chapter of Mark, the 22nd through the 24th verse. <laughs> Every single time. Hallelujah. He, he didn't open with another single scripture the entire time. He was teaching faith library. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now he did use other scriptures, but he always started there. Hallelujah. Now, it's bad when he would leave you in the middle of a story and you had to wait till Wednesday to finish it. He'd start on Monday. If he left, he had to come back on Wednesday and pick up where he left off and finish it up. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. But uh, we're not going to open to Mark 11. We're going to open to the 103rd Psalm. Hallelujah. I just said all that just for whatever reason I said it. Actually, just so you know, uh, you're not going to come out and get some span, uh, uh, brand spanking new teaching on uh, healing or faith that's never been taught before. We're just, we're just giving you the word to put faith out there, put faith in people, give them something to build their faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Dad Hagen said this one time. He said, you know, cause, and, and you think how relative, how relative can a sermon that's 30 or 40 years old be for today when you hear something? He said, he said you wouldn't know that himself took your infirmities and bear your, sickness, and bear your sicknesses if the Bible didn't say so. You wouldn't know that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus if the Bible didn't say so. You see, you got people running around saying, we don't need the Bible. We just need Jesus on the inside. He's the whole. How would you know what his word said? You wouldn't know. There'd be no way to know. Oh, he'll teach you. The Bible said, you know what, you know what the Holy Ghost said? Uh, Jesus said about the Holy Ghost? He'll teach you what sort of things I've said unto you. Yeah. Well, how are you going to know what he said? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I'm telling you, the, 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 the Bible's important. Amen. Amen. Don't, don't ever think. Don't ever think. You, just, you, you hear somebody saying that stuff, say, look at them on the television or, or the radio and say, bunk, Tommy Rot, and turn them off. Because they're being led by the wrong spirit. That's, right. That's the wrong spirit. Amen. See, the Holy Ghost will lead you in line with the Word. The Holy Spirit will lead you in line with the Word. He'll guide you to the Word. Yes. Amen. Amen. What, 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 what if I can't, what if they can't read and write? Get somebody, get, find somebody that can read and write and have them read it to you. Because yeah. yeah. you you're not going to know without the Word. Yeah. Well, I would know that. You wouldn't know that. See, the only reason you ha think you would know that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus is because you've heard it read, uh, spoken from the Word before. Yeah. Now, let me, let me say something. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get myself in trouble. Do you know there's a time in our history in the, in, in the European history uh, was referred to as the Dark Ages. Do you know what took place during the Dark Ages? They took the Bible away from the people, gave it only to the priest, and, he, and, all, and all the people could get were pictures on the stained glass windows. And they walked in darkness. Why? Because the entrance of thy word, and they did mass in a language they didn't even speak. Yeah. <laughs> they did their services in a language that the common people didn't speak. Hello? What happened? They went into darkness. I said they went into darkness. They went into darkness. The entrance of thy word, it giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. So the 103rd Psalm, praise God, starting in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Well, how are we going to know what his benefits are if they're not written down? Amen. We thank God for the word. Amen. Well, you know, uh, David wrote them down by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Who forgiveth? Thank God he forgives. All thine iniquities. Who healeth? All thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies thy mouth with 
cancer and AIDS and poverty and destruction. Oh, that's not what it says, is it? Now, actually, the King James here, the, the, the next three words after the, this, this word I'm about to read are in italics. They're not in the Greek. I mean, not, sorry, not in the Greek. Not in the Hebrew. They were added by the translators. Let me read it the way too, they, that they was read in Hebrew. Who satisfies thy mouth with good. Yes. Not just good things, with good. Yes. Things can be good, but there's more, there's more, to, good, there's more to good than things. Yes. Yes. Now, things will be included. But there's more to it than just things. There's more to it than just a car or a house. Praise God. Hallelujah. David said the 23rd Psalm, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise God. Goodness and mercy follow me around. Praise God. I said goodness and mercy follow me around. Praise God. Who satisfy thy mouth with good. Then it says, Thy youth is renewed like the eagles. <laughs> Woo, glory. I said, Woo, glory. Well, what did James say? James said, Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father above, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That's over in the first chapter of the book of James. Look over there. See it in your Bible. This is, you know, you can mark. You, did you mark this place out in the 103rd Psalm? Hold your place there. Don't lose it. We're coming back there probably sometime in this service. I did say probably. Don't hold me to it if I don't. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 7, and actually verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. What, what's he talking about? Well, let's back up just a little bit. Verse 12, uh, 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them to do whatever they want to do. To them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, <laughs> I am tempted of God. You know, I wish some people would just read their Bibles every once in a while. People say all kinds of stuff, and you go to the Bible and you read and say, Well, the Bible says this. Well, I, I'm, I'm way out beyond that. Or, well, that's what my grandmama always said. Look, grandmama, I had a grandmama. She, can't, she couldn't even quote certain scriptures right. She told me I was supposed to be rooted and grounded in holiness, which was our denomination. We were Pentecostal holiness. The Bible said rooted and grounded in love. Right. Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither or neither. You say neither, I say neither. Okay. Was that Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers in that movie? <laughs> you say neither, I say neither. You say either, I say either. You know? You say potato, I say potato. Okay, so who make everybody happy? Neither or neither. Tempteth. He any man. Boy, but God's been blamed for a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. I said God's been blamed for a whole lot of stuff. And the Bible says he doesn't tempt people with evil. Amen. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away after his, of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Do not err. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Do not err. My, my, my. He said, do not err, my beloved brethren. You see that in your Bible? Is that in your Bible? Yes. All right. Do not err. What, don't, what are we not supposed to err about, brother, uh, pastor? What is it we're not supposed to err about? Oh, my, my, my. You know, James, what is it we're not supposed to err about? Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He ain't flaky. Yeah. God's not flaky. Amen? <laughs> Woo! Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. 
Now you got folks running around these days saying, I, I, I've heard preachers say it. Then people laying hands on people, they're laying hands on them of the devil. The devil's healing people. Now I understand, you know, in demonic cultures, the people, witch doctors and stuff, are doing things by the power of Satan. When people lay hands on people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and commanded them to be healed in Jesus' name, that's not the devil at work. Right. I said, that's not the devil at work. Right. Yeah. You know, God put that sickness on them to teach them a lesson. And then preachers come along saying they can lay hands on the sick and get them healed. They're of the devil. Isn't that interesting? You know, uh, Acts 10, 38, you got that thing. I'll run over there real quick. Just hold your finger where we are. I'm trying to slow down so you get time to look it up in your Bible. <laughs> Amen. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Now, isn't it amazing that when the Bible was written, that healing was good and that uh, sickness and disease was oppression of the devil? Now you got folks running around now saying that God oppressed them and put it on them and anybody trying to lay hands on them, get them healed of the devil. That's when them dumb devils, <laughs> them lying dumb devils, they've been lying to folk. Are y'all here? You're going home. Well, my brother, you never know what God's going to do. Yeah, I do. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with them. Amen. Well, James said, what about doing good and healing all? What about doing good and healing? Healing is good. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the back over in James. Now, every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father above, cometh down from above. Amen. Hallelujah. It's from above. Coming from the Father of lights. Yeah. Thank God he's light. He didn't lead us into darkness. He leads us into the light. I said he leads us into the light. But notice here something. He finishes this particular scripture with. He says, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He said in the old covenant... Now, if you'll get your, you know, we've said this before, and we'll say it again, we'll just re re go over the things. You'll get your, go get your, just a Schofield reference Bible. Now, if you're a good Southern Baptist, you've got a Schofield reference Bible. Okay, I just, I'm just telling you, isn't that right, Brother Bill? <laughs> you know? And Dr. Schofield, <laughs> thank God, he had, he, he had truth and light. Yeah. Amen? Uh, talked about the, the name of Jehovah. In the old covenant. And he said it was the ever increasing name, uh, covenant name with an ever increasing revelation. Starting out with Jehovah, the covenant keeping God, the God who keeps covenant. And then each compound name of the covenant became Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Tzid Kenu, Jehovah uh, Shalom. Uh, there's seven of them. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. Or the Lord thy physician. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, thy provider. Jehovah D.C., our banner of victory. Jehovah Shalom, our, uh, the, the, God of our, the God who is our peace. Jehovah the Sid Kedu, the Lord, our righteousness. Praise God. Are you here? Each time God, um, each time God, there was a compound name given to his Jehovah, it was part of a revelation of who he is as the covenant-keeping God. Now here James says he never changes. Well, you know, the Word of God says what? I am the Lord and I change not. When he, when he spoke to Israel in Exodus, I believe the 15th chapter in the 26th or the 36th verse. You know, now you understand you got you to do, do, do a little study. But in that chapter where it says I'll put none of these diseases upon thee, which I put upon the Egyptians. The, uh, the tense of the verb there is not causative. It's, it's permissive. Better translate, I'll allow. But let's just take it for the argument of the people who want to argue that, you know, God puts stuff on folk. He said, if you'll obey my commandments and obey my word, these things won't come on you. That's right. the, we got Christians. I mean, you know, sinners, you can understand, they don't, they're not studying the Bible. They're not studying God. 
You can understand them being misinformed and uninformed. And I'll tell you where most of their misinformation comes from. It comes from the church. Yeah. Hello? It comes from the people who's supposed to know. Yo, know, here you go home. They didn't just make this stuff up about God. Dumb, dumb dumbs taught it to them. Amen. And where was I going before I got on the dumb dumbs? I like dumb dumb pops. Y'all like little dumb dumb pops? <laughs> That wasn't a real good save, was it? Just not going to weasel my way out of that. Now, you know, the church, the church should know who God is and what God will do and what God said he would do. Amen? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> but we got Christians, and this is where, this is where the world gets for it. They go to funerals. The Lord knows what he's doing. He, he, he snatched them from the earth. I'll never forget the funeral of, of, of my sister-in-law. Her daddy died. And he had suffered with leukemia. I mean, and he, you know, a difficult life. He had, you know, he got saved near the end of his life. And right before that, he was a, he, he just lived a rough life. An alcoholic. I mean, they say he was mean. I mean, people talk about how mean he was, you know. But he got saved. Thank God he got saved. And I went to the funeral, you know, and there's a doctor so-and-so that I knew him. He used to come to Parker to sit at the, at the table. He was this good man, loved, you know, you know, loved the Lord, you know, ministered, the, you know, ministered in his church and stuff. But he was wrong. Yeah. Doctor so-and-so got up and talked about how that God looked over the heavenly banisters and looked down into the earth and saw that rose in the earth and he needed on the heavenly mantle. And he reached over and plucked him from the earth. Yeah, that's what I said. Huh? Now, you got sinners sitting all there, and they're just sitting there going, what? This is who God is? This is what God does? They didn't make this stuff up. They got it from the church. Yeah. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. If the church is blind, how are you going to expect the world to see the light? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen? We got Christians. Running around believing that God's putting stuff on them to teach them some lesson. They can't figure out what the lesson is he's trying to teach them. Yeah. Now, let's just, let's just regress a little bit. Because we're, now, we're New Covenant believers. We're not Old Testament Christians. We're New Testament. We're, we're, we're under the, the, the New and the Better Covenant. Yeah. Established on better promises. We're in, a new, we're in a New Covenant established on better promises. Y'all understand that, don't you? Yeah. But let's just run back to the Old Testament a little bit. Do you ever see God putting anything on anybody to teach them something when they hadn't done something wrong? Amen. Never. The only time Israel ever got into trouble, are you here? Got women into captivity, lost battles, bad stuff happened, is when they disobeyed and sinned. And they knew what they'd done. Right. Or God told them. Remember when they, when they were supposed to kill everybody and not take anything and one of the people went out and took something and buried it in his tent? Right. Yeah. And they lost and things were bad and the Lord said, you know, there's sin in the camp. Someone, somebody's done this. And they went and found them and got them out and they took care of it. Yeah. What are you trying to say? You don't find in the Old Testament. Now, the one book everybody loves to run to is Job. Oh my. Now, first of all, chronologically, Job's the oldest book in the Bible. So a lot of what they know about God, they don't, they, they haven't, ha has nothing to read. But let me say this. Look, look, look real quick. Go to Job. Now, we're not going to read all the stuff that happened to him. We'll just pick up and, now, hold your place in James. Hold your place in um, Acts. Y'all just need to buy more of these little stringy things and just stick them all in your Bible so you can keep, keep up with me. Hallelujah. Now Job's right before Psalms, or the book of Psalms. <clears throat> now Job chapter 1, there wasn't, I wasn't planning on going to Job tonight. This is just direction by the Holy Ghost. We're going to go with him. Is that all right? There was a man in the land of us. Now it wasn't Oz, it was us. There was named Job. Now, some people say Job, but it's pronounced Job. That man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and shoot evil. And there was born unto him through seven sons and three daughters. His substance was seven thousand sheep. Yada 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 yada. Verse five. Uh, 
Well, verse 4, and his sons went and feasted in their houses. Everyone on his day, I mean, it's on the birthday, they had a week-long feast or so. And sent and called for the three sisters to eat and drink with them. In other words, every time one of them had a birthday, that's ten times a year. <laughs> They'd have a drunken hoedown. No puns intended there. <laughs> oh, me. Hoedown. Oh, no, no, no. Anyway. And so... <laughs> Come on, you know that's funny. <laughs> and so it was, that their, their fasts were gone about, that Job was sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning to offer burnt offerings, according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that they, my sons of sin, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. What's he operating in? Fear. 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 Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves unto the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, let me just stop here real quick. The reason Satan could come up there is because Adam sold out his authority. Adam, Adam had the right to come up to the very presence of God, and that's how far Satan got when Adam sold out. He got the liberty, not the, he got the authority to come to the very throne of God. He could take the throne of God, but he come right up to it. That's why when the blood of Jesus was shed, it cleaned everything in the temple up to, but not including the throne of God. And Satan was among them, and the Lord said to Satan, Whence cometh thou? Then Satan said to the Lord, uh, From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. And the Lord, the Lord says unto Satan, I've got a guy out there, I know you haven't seen him. You have I, no idea who he is, but I want you to consider attacking my servant Job. That's how people read it. Yeah. And it's because they read it out of King James, and King James translates this awkwardly um, where it says here in, in, in the King James, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Now that makes it sound like, duh, the devil's never seen Job. I've been to and fro all the earth. I've been looking for somebody to put something on. Can't find anybody. And God goes, hey, consider Job. Wow, I could have had a V8. Are y'all here? You're going home. But my margin says that the Hebrew says, have you set your heart on? Hast thou set thy heart on my servant Job? For there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth thee. Let me stop here. <laughs> Job's rich. Shoes evil. He's like a bright light on the planet. You think the devil missed him? Not a chance. Hello? Not a chance he had missed Job. Now, he was there to find out something. See, things weren't quite clear. They, he didn't know how far his authority went. That's why I said, you, have you set your heart on my servant, Job? Amen. And, and Satan goes and responds, who's Job? Who's Job? I, 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 no, that's not what he says, is it? See, so let's get rid of this mindset that the devil comes up and God sees the devil coming. He thinks, you know what? I'm just going to put something on Job. And the devil is my dog. He's my, he's my, he's my pit bull, and I'm going to say, sick him to the devil and put him on Job. No. God says, if you put your heart on my servant Job, Satan goes, he knows who Job is. Does, does Job serve God for naught? He knows he, serve, he knows he serves God. He knows who he is. Thou hast made a hedge about, hast thou not made a hedge about him, his house, and everything, uh, and about all he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and the substance has increased in the land. But put, forth, put, 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 uh, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, now you got to understand, there's a, there's a, there is a, basically a spiritual legal discussion going on here. Satan thinks he's got authority to do something, but he's not sure. He says, you put a hedge around him. And God, God says, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, you read this, you, if you don't have the right interpretation or the right perspective coming into it, you'll read it and think, oh man, God put the devil. Huh. Why couldn't he touch Job? Because Job wasn't afraid for his own life. Everything, now, everything that happened to Job happened for a reason. And it wasn't that God chose him out to put something on him. Look over to the third chapter, verse 25. And Job says this, For the thing which I greatly feared 
has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I think, y'all, anybody have an idea what fear is? It's negative faith. It's faith in Antichrist, or right? faith in the things against God. It's faith in the devil. It really is. See, Satan plants thoughts into your life. If you lay hold of them and begin to th meditate on them, fear is produced. Fear is, fear is a powerful reciprocal of faith. Or, or, or antithesis of faith. It's the opposite of faith. Faith believes God. Fear believes the devil. Job tells us why everything happened. He was afraid of everything that happened. Satan came to find out, came in there to find out if he had authority to do anything or not. God can't lie. God can't say, don't, you don't have authority. Job opened the door to all that stuff through fear. Everything that happened was something that happened that Job was afraid would happen. Amen. Now that answers the whole book right there, basically. Well, in this he didn't speak wrongly or evil. Well, listen, if you're speaking out, out of ignorance, you're not speaking wrong or evil. You're speaking in ignorance. People say stuff in ignorance. I'm going to tell you something. You can take somebody who just got saved last week, and they're not, they're not maturing the things of God. They're a babe. They, you know, and they go to a church, and they say, speaking in tongues of the devil. And they go around and start telling everybody, speaking in tongues of the devil. That's not blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. They're ignorant. God's not going to count that as evil against them. He's not going to, he's not going to nail their high to the wall over there. But I'm telling you, we get somebody who's, uh, who's mature in the things of God, mature in the Word of God, who knows the Word of God and knows what's true and so on. And for whatever purpose they go out and say, speaking in tongues of the devil, that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Say, say the same thing, but see, there's a difference in how, who, who, and, who and when they said it. The babe's not going to be, it's not going to be, it's not going to be evil. They're just ignorant. There's a difference between ignorance and purposefully saying things wrong or doing things wrong. Y'all hear you going home. Now, I grew up Pentecostal. We used to, I mean, the Baptist got on television one week and said, you know, we don't believe in speaking. And I said, listen, you got to some, some preachers just walking in, not in, they're walking in darkness in certain areas. But I mean, if the Baptist preacher got it one week and, and said speaking in tongues is of the devil or, or, or something like that, I mean, the Pentecostal guy get up next week and start saying, there they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. But they're walking in ignorance. They're not. Now, if the lights come, they reject the light and they say it, then they're, then they're blaspheming. There's a big difference. Amen. Oh, my. But we see, if you, get people to, if you can just get people to the Word, <laughs> praise God. If you can get them to the Word and get them to shut down all the excuses everybody's fed them, spoon-fed them, you can, you can get them over and get them help. Amen. You can, get them, you can get them help. Praise the Lord. And so, Job says, so I'm not, I'm not going to go through the book of Job. But we do know this, at the, back of the, at the end of the book of Job, he got everything back. I said he got everything back. Now, Job wasn't out being an evil man. He wasn't out, he wasn't out sinning and, you know, running around with women and all this stuff happened because of that. He opened, he opened a spiritual door through fear. It wasn't that he was being evil and he was, he was smoking dope and carousing with women and, I mean, having parties at his house all the time. That was his kids. <laughs> he kept trying to keep them sanctified and cleaned up. All right. But you read the end of the book, all that Job lost, he got back double. Yes. Now, you've got to understand, since Job is the first book of the Bible, there's a lot of stuff that's just not written yet. There's, not, there's nothing to read, there's nothing to go to, there's nothing for revelation. Yeah. So we're navigating. Amen? Then, then the written word starts going. Once the written word comes in, we have, we have a basis of what to believe and how to see. People teach Job like it's the doctrine of the New Testament church. It's, a, it's an experience of a man and, and God restoring, but he, there's still, the, still the, the truth there that fear opened the door. It's a historical book. It's not a doctrinal book. And did you know this? Now, I know he says this. I've heard, how many of you ever heard this at a funeral? But the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, let me tell you something. That is a Holy Ghost inspired recording of one of the most uninspired statements in the history of man. It was recorded because it was historical. Didn't mean it was accurate. 
God don't, God don't hide his trash. There's no cover-ups with God. He, do, he doesn't, um, oh, redact. Is that the right word? Redact the scriptures. In other words, when, it, when something's been redacted, they go in, they, they block out. You know, you, Capitol Hill, the senators want a certain report, and it comes, comes redacted. There's black marks, all through stuff all over the page, because there's names and there's stuff there that can't, that's top secret. God doesn't redact the scriptures. He puts it all out there. Amen? amen. Said amen. So the, the Word of God recorded what Job said, but it did not say that God, Job was inspired by the Holy Ghost to say it. That's right. Amen. But 90% of the church world will preach that at the funeral. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now Job just got in, in, in a moment of anguish and despair said that. That's, but that wasn't inspired of the Holy Ghost. He didn't say, yea, thus saith the Lord. I am the Lord that giveth, and I am the Lord that taketh away. Blessed be my name. That's not what was said, is it? Job said that out of his anguish. That, how, many, how many of you ever had people say stuff out of their anguish that they knew they didn't mean? Yeah. Or it wasn't accurate? Amen. We've all done that. You've met Christians. Why did God do this? They, they, don't, they don't even know what they're saying half the time. That's why I say when you're trying to minister, when you go to minister to someone that's, that's had a loss, most of the time you just don't need any, any trying to do a bunch of stuff. Just love on them. Put your arm around them. Let them know you're there. You got time later when they're, when they're not in that moment of anguish. And if they say something, don't jump all over the throat. Don't jump down their throat. Now that's one thing. If you're sitting over there and somebody walks in and says, you know, the Lord knows what he's doing. You jump up and say, hey, I don't believe God did this for a minute. That's different. But the person that's anguish, you don't go in there and jump down their throat. They're saying stuff out of, out of hurt. They're not saying stuff because they really believe it. Amen? All right. Let's leave Job. <laughs> Y'all enjoyed the Bible? Amen. Journey through the Bible with Pastor Ed. Hallelujah. Run back over to the 103rd Psalm once again. Because now we're going to come up. Now, listen. Now, now we're, you know, think, we start getting Scripture. Did you notice that Jesus didn't say as it's written in the book of Job? Are you here? He didn't quote when people were sick and they need, they need to have an answer to why they were sick. He didn't say, well, you know, like in Job it says. Jesus quoted the Psalms, the prophets, the law. Y'all here, you're going home. Was that Job not, is Job not a, uh, a, a, a scriptural book? It's, it's, it's a historical book. It's, it, God wanted that, that book in there for us to glean from. Fear opens the door. Also to see how far Satan's authority went because of the fall of man. There's things in there that, that are vital to our understanding of spiritual authority. Now I know you're going to go find things where, you know, different ones say stuff and say, you know, this happened because of that. And they know. But you've got to take the whole book in, in complete context and understand the whole thing. Of what, what they're, they're uh, traversing through there. Hallelujah. Psalm 103. I'm back at Psalm 3. That's not going to work. It's, a good, it's always a good song, but... But let's look here where it says, Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What's the first two? Forgives all thy iniquities, heals all thy diseases. Now run over with me, if you will, from there uh, to the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 1, it says, Lord, uh, Who hath believed thy report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. In other words, he wasn't Mr. GQ. I'm telling you now, everything is so marketed that if you're slick, cool, and GQ looking, people want to follow you. They're following the flesh when that's happening. That's right. And people who are doing it are catering to their flesh. Amen. That doesn't mean show up like a bum. But let's stop playing the game. You know, right now, there are stars galore in the music industry, and the only reason they're stars is because they look good. Yeah. If it weren't for the synthesis, synthesization and, and, and the grinding, bumping moves in the video, they'd be waiting on your table at, at Cracker Barrel when you went there tonight. Yeah. They're, they're not talented. They just got the look. And we have a culture and a society that's all about the look. They don't care about the content. They just care about the look. 
Hello? Yet the Bible says of Jesus, he had no form, no comeliness that we should desire him. In other words, people didn't follow him around because he was some, some good-looking, charismatic dude that everybody just drooled over. Amen. You get preachers sometimes, you get so caught up with how they look. They got the look. They got the right watch. They got the right haircut. They got the right hand-tailored suit with the right cobbler-made shoes with the right this and the right that. And people are all caught up with all that stuff. And they're not, and, you can, and they, those people can go out there with the right marketing and be, I mean, they can be preaching junk. And people follow because it it's marketed right. But Jesus came without the form of the comeliness to be desired. And they followed him. Because I'm going to tell you, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. Uh, Hand-tailored suits aren't going to meet your needs in the hour of despair. Amen. Are you here? The right car isn't going to heal your child in the middle of the night. Amen. Amen. If they've got on hand-tailored suits, that's not going to make, that's not going to change, I mean, uh, shoes, cobbler-made shoes. That's not going to fix your finances when they're, they're trying to t rep repossess your house. Y'all hear you going home. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. And the word sorrows comes from the Hebrew makob, M-A-K-O-B. These are transliteral, you know, you understand these languages had different letters than we use. So these are transliterated in the English letters. Makob, meaning grief or pain or sorrows. And acquainted with grief comes from the Hebrew koile, C-H-O-I-L-Y. That means disease, grief, sickness. Now, Brown, uh, Driver, and Briggs concordance. Now, the song says disease, grief, or sickness. B uh, Brown, Driver, Briggs says just sickness. He only, they only give this term, this word, the translation of sickness. So a man acquainted with sickness. We, were, we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our sickness. As the word grief is coily again. Our sickness and carried our makeup, our sorrows, or our grief or our pain. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Verse 10 says this, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to, to grief. One translation bears this out and actually says it, because that is against Corley. It says he hath made him sick. What for? So you wouldn't have to be. And I said, so you wouldn't have to be. Yeah, now, 1 Peter 2.24. First Peter 2, verse 24. You know, I, I, <laughs> I need to shape up here. I'm over here in Philippians. Good book too, <laughs> but it's not where I need to be. Let, let's back up just a little bit. Verse 21, for even, for even here too, uh, unto you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Now what did Jesus suffer for? Let me say something. Not one thing did Jesus suffer he didn't know was coming. Yeah. And why? In the garden he said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Yeah, Paul was sick. Jesus said, he appeared unto Paul and said, I've shown him what things he must suffer for my name's sake. It was persecution. And, and then he lists those things over in... Um, Oh, I believe first or second, maybe Acts. When he lists all the things, you know, the night and the day and the deep, you know, all these, he starts listening. He lists, not one time did he ever say he was sick, God made him sick. Yeah. Not one time. He listed all the things he went through. He was beat, he was shipwrecked, he was stoned, left for dead. I mean, you know, he went through, he went through a bunch of stuff. Not one time did he say he was sick. But even that, the Lord showed him what he must suffer for his name's sake. He, he had, he agreed. Listen, he, he got a chance to up front to agree whether he was going to take it or not. Well, he was going to, he, the Lord said, if you, you're going to serve me, this is what you're going to, to you're going to go through. You're going to be persecuted. This stuff's going to happen to you. Jesus knew what was coming. He went into, he went into the garden because he knew what was coming and the weight was heavy. Amen. So let's just take Jesus and let's take Paul. That, that takes out two thirds of the, uh, of the suffering people's argument. And we've already dealt with Job, so that just does away with all of them. Yeah. Yeah. This random God's making you sick to teach you something that you can't figure out what it is. He's trying to teach you things. 
Both Jesus and Paul knew ahead of time what it was that God was going to do and why they had to suffer in order to get it done. Hello. You got Christians running around going, you know, the Lord's trying, you know, people are trying to encourage them. Well, you know, the Lord knows what he's doing. Yeah, well, what is he trying to teach me? Well, we don't know. We just don't know his ways. Well, by, what I see from the Bible, his ways are to tell us ahead of time yeah. when things like that are going to happen. Yeah. So we're prepared to deal with it. Yeah. Amen. And it got so bad one place, Paul went to the Lord and said, Lord, I, I, bes I, bes I besought the Lord thrice that he might remove this thing from me, the, the messenger of Satan. Yes. Amen? And then you read that, not one time does it say it's sickness. It was not pithomalia, whatever, that stupid oriental eye disease of the runny pus running out of his eyes. Paul was the sickest of all men. He would have plucked his eyes out for us. So, you know, you go, people just read stuff in the Bible that just ain't there. Just dumb stuff. Well, he tells the messenger of Satan, he, and, you know, a thorn in the flesh. Well, if you look in the back of the Old Testament, he said that, the, that certain people would be thorns in their sides. Yeah, huh? It wasn't literal, it was figurative. That's right. Mm -hmm. I said it was figurative. Right. It was irritant. Mm -hmm. The messenger of Satan was an irritant. They weren't running around with the whatever ite stuck out their side. Are you here? The, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet him was buffeting him. And let me say this. I don't care what it was, you ain't Paul. Yeah. And you haven't written two-thirds of the New Testament. Because yeah. he said for the abundance, he knew why he was suffering the persecution and the buffeting. For the abundance of the revelation. Lest I be exalted above measure. Now, anybody says I got Paul's thorns with the most arrogant, lifted up in pride, stuck up people I've ever met. Because they mean, that means they're about ready to write two-thirds more of the New Testament. Y'all hear you going home. <clears throat> Dear Lord Jesus, you're not Paul. You don't have Paul's thorn. And Paul's thorn wasn't a thorn. It was a messenger of Satan. I believe Ang Angelos in the Greek. There's my walking concordance. I just checked in with him. <laughs> Angel. A demonic angel was sent to buffet him, harass him, harass him. And Paul went on and said, you know, people think, oh, moreover, I will rest in my sickness. That's not what Paul said. He said, I'll, re I'll rest in my infirmities, my weaknesses. What? That the power of Christ might rest on me. Some people get, the, I don't know why I'm way over here, but it's okay anyhow. Some people get the idea that, in, that, that when they get sick, they're supposed to rest in their sickness and the power of God. And all, they, and all the power of God can do for people is help them put up with it. Well, if that's where your faith is, that's what you're going to get. But most people relegate the power of God in their weakness as the ability to put up with. Just get by. Hello? Tolerate the whatever's going on. No, 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 no. He said, Paul said, that's when I'm strong. Because see, when we reach the end of our strength, his strength comes on. And I want you to know something. God's strength is greater than just tolerating, putting up with, or holding on. Yeah. If you read, you read the Word of God, Paul writes later and says this, that he's convinced of this is something that neither death nor life there are things present, there are things past, there are angels. Oh, it goes on this a whole bunch of stuff. Shall I be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Amen. He said, and what was he saying in that same passage? He says, we're more than the conquerors through him that loved us. He didn't say we're more than, how, he didn't say we barely hold on through him that loved us. He said we're more than conquerors. Romans chapter 8, 28. Somewhere down there. Look in your Bible. Don't take my word for it. <clears throat> Nay, in all these things we are more than con Listen. <clears throat> for the, the sake of all the along, we are slaughtered. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, they, they face death all the time. I mean, you can get tired of facing death all the time. You know what I'm talking about? You, you can get tired of every time you open mouth you somebody wants to stone you or throw you over, or throw you over, boil you in oil or something. I can get wearisome. 
But Paul says, and we're all over there long counting the sheep for the slaughter. Now in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Neither night nor death, nor life, nor angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, debt, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. We're more than conquerors, glory to God. Didn't say we just get to hang on and, you know, and hang on, tie a rope and hang on. And cry, help me, help me, Jesus, help me, help me, Lord, help me, help me. Somehow, some way. We're more than, Paul said we're more than conquerors. This does not sound like the man who's barely getting along. I mean, I ain't going to drag into heaven by the skin of his teeth. Amen. John, the apostle John, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said in 1 John 5, 4, this is the victory <laughs> that overcometh the world, even our faith. We're overcomers. We're overcomers. I said, we're overcomers. Amen. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. My, my, my. We're more than conquerors. So when Paul's talking about his thorn, he wasn't talking about, you know, he's, God made him sick. And the grace of God just enabled him to put up with that disease until the end. No, the grace of, I'll tell you what, the grace of God empowers you. When you're, in, when you're weak, the grace of God empowers you and strengthens you. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Hallelujah. Where was it before we ran over here to Romans? Anybody know? I don't have any notes to look at. Because not a thing that I just said tonight saying any kind of note that I got. I'll make some notes out of this. has been a good sermon. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. See, Paul, yeah, Paul knew what he was going to have to suffer. How many have Paul's revelations? Look, we've been studying and teaching his revelations for decades and centuries. We still ain't got it all. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> We're still working on that. Hello? I got it all. One man came to Brother Hagin one time and said, I want you to pray for me. He said, what for? He said, well, the Lord showed me that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a ministry bigger than all the apostles and, 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 and everything in, in, in the church uh, throughout history. As a matter of fact, the only one that's going to have a bigger ministry ever in the history of the church will be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I want you to pray for me that it comes to pass. He said, I can't do that. He said, where'd you get that from? Well, sister so-and-so came through and prophesied over me and told me that. <laughs> oh my my nobody's going to have a ministry like that nobody's going to have the revelations of Paul Paul had those we're not going to, we don't need to rewrite the Bible they're foundational apostles we don't need to rewrite the Bible we don't have to need somebody to get a new revelation and come right add on to the Bible we've got the word I knew a man I'm trying to close up <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me ask before we go too far. Anybody need us to lay hands on you to be healed? All right. All right. I'll get to you in just a minute. All right. Hallelujah. Paul said, I knew a man about 13, 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Such a one was called up into the third heaven and, uttered, and heard things unlawful to be uttered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you go study that, that. That gives us a secret. When Paul was let stone and left for dead, that's when I believe this took place. His spirit left. He went up into heaven. And the revelation of who the believer is in Christ, what we have in Christ, and what it means to be a new creature in Christ was given to him. But he, it took him the rest of his life to write it out because he couldn't just come back and share it. It had to be written out in doctrine because if he had just shared it verbally and left it out there like that without writing it out in doctrine, right? And we, we talked about this a few weeks ago how that Peter recognized the writings of Paul as Scripture. Okay. If it wasn't written out in doctrine, people would have twisted it. Well, they did anyway. Peter said, people take, take what my brother, beloved brother Paul says, and those that are unlearned do rest or twist the scriptures. As they all do also with other, the other scriptures, Peter said. <laughs> he equated Paul's writings to scripture. And he could do that because he had apostolic authority. <laughs> Didn't need the council wherever that the, the church got together and did. Peter did it. He was not the first pope. Had a wife. How do you know? He had a mother-in-law. You don't get a mother-in-law without a wife. That's 
<laughs> Amen. You just don't get them. They, they, they come together. You know what I'm saying? It's a package deal. <laughs> Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. <laughs> stop saying my wife saying stop it. <laughs> Paul was called into the third heaven, saw all these things, heard all these things, and then by the Holy Ghost, he had to digest that in his spirit and write that out as doctrine by the, by the guidance of the Holy Ghost for the church. He just come back and start, oh man, I went to heaven. See, I went, I went to heaven, I saw this, I heard that, I know this, and start sharing that and blabbing it all over the place. It had gotten all messed up and, and, and people would have rejected his writing probably by the time they got him. And so they didn't get lifted up. I mean, that's the, the, the angel, Satan came back after him and started to buffet him. You don't have Paul's thorn. It's not even called Paul's thorn, but the church calls it that. So just for reference sake, you don't have it. You're not Paul. You don't have the revelations. You don't have the thorn. Hello. And even in that, the Lord appeared to him and showed him what things he must suffer for his name's sake. And we see what Paul went through. He was persecuted. He was whipped. He was beat. He was naked. Fastings. Destitute. Thrown over the wall. Hello? Yeah. Shipwrecked. Yeah. Bit by snakes. Amen. Never did he say he was sick. He had a time that he was going to have to go through all this. The church has bought the lie that God puts stuff on you to teach you a lesson and you don't even know why you're getting taught. Now did I tell you this morning what Nathan said? Did I, did I share this morning with the church or did I share it with just somebody private what Nathan said this morning on the way to church? Did I say, well, so if you weren't here this morning, just so you get it. We're, we're coming to church. We got talk, we're talking along some of these lines about, um, just about, you know, uh, what people believe. You know, that God teaching people lessons, killing wife, killing a kid. And I, and I said something along the lines of, you know, man, I'll tell you what. What about the poor person who gets killed so you can learn a lesson? <laughs> God's going to kill them with a truck and give them disease. I mean, make them suffer so you can learn something. And Nathan said, man, you know what? It's just better to be dumb, isn't it? <laughs> He's talking about spiritually. Because that way you're always on the end of being taught. You're never the teacher getting killed. <laughs> he figured out real quick under those, under those kind of thoughts, it's just best to be spiritually stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And they're always trying to teach you something. Because, I mean, you know, you don't want to be the one that you're being used to teach with. Because uh -huh. you're the one that dies. And suffers while they learn whatever it is that they don't know what it is they're supposed to learn. That's called asinine. Amen. Stupid. It's not a cuss word. It's in the dictionary. A-S-I-N-I-N-N-E. Uh, it basically is a nice long way. Probably even folks in Texas use it which means our Eastern Carolina relatives used it because I know they had to settle Texas. Why? Because all the colloquials are what we used. But Texas always think they're the ones that had it all. Anyway, now I'm just messing. I'll probably get myself in trouble if I don't watch it. So I'm going to show Pastor Hagen this and he'll get me. All right. They're proud of their Texas history. Stupid. It's stupid. No. Healing, no, we never got there. We, we, we read 1 Peter 2.24. By, did we read 1 Peter 2.24? We went over there and never, did we ever read it? We just got there. Y'all give me just a little bit more time. I know we're running a little bit late, but you know what? And I know we're used to getting at it right at a certain time on Sunday night, but, you, but uh, you know, I got to follow the Holy Ghost. I thought we'd be done in about 30 minutes tonight. <laughs> and that's what I get for thinking. Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 24, who is own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, we oh, I'm, I know we were reading earlier, weren't we? We had backed up just a little bit. Well, anyway, who is own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now, you'll get some people come along and say, well, I'm Dr. So-and-so. I got my PhD and all this kind of stuff. And they'll say, now, this isn't talking about physical ailments. It's talking about the sin. It's talking about the disease, the, uh, the sickness and ailment of sin. Wow. Well, see, if you just take 1 Peter 2.24 and Isaiah 53.5 and hear somebody say it's got a bunch of letters behind their name, you might run off and go, oh, my, oh, my. It's not talking about physical diseases at all. It's talking about, you know, that I'm healed from sin. Oh, thank you. And we all, listen. That means, can I really say something? You don't get healed of sin. You get born again from sin. You repent for sin. You get healed from sickness. 
And that would be all well, fine, and dandy if it weren't for Matthew 8, 16, and 17. Yeah. That little nasty little scripture for their doctrine, God just slid it right in there and messed that up. Because it says here, well, let's back up verse 14 just to show you Peter had a wife. <laughs> Matthew 8, 14, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Now, you can't have a wife's mother unless you've got a wife, and if you've got a wife, you're married. Yeah. <laughs> don't believe me. Go home and tell your wife that I'm not married and see what happens to you. No, don't, because I don't have time for a funeral this week. He touched her hand, the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. When evening was come, verse 16, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils or demons, and actually this phrase possessed with devils, if you, if you look, if you study this out a little bit in, in the Greek, you'll find it more, it's more like demonized. Now people, some people can't be possessed, fully possessed. But a lot of people are just demonized. They're, they're under the influence of demons. They're not possessed with them, they're just under the influence of them. They're, they're, they're influencing their thoughts, they're influencing their actions. They're not controlling. See, if you're possessed, you're controlled. Yeah. If you're demonized, you're under their influence, but you're still, you're not, you're not forced yeah. into doing things. Okay. Now, I, listen. I believe there's demon possession. I believe you got, you know, you got, but you know, you got to cast devil out of demonized people. The Christians can have demons in their flesh. They can't be possessed, though. They can't have that in their spirit. It can be in their mind. Can't be in their spirit. Your your spirit can't be possessed of God and of the devil at the same time. Now, your flesh can be strongly under the influence of the devil, but you can't be possessed. Um. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Praise the Lord. Healed them of their spiritual sin. You know, it says he healed sick folk. That it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. He healed sick folk that it might fulfill Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5, which 1 Peter 2.24 quotes. You can't, say it's, uh, you can't say anything else except what the Bible says it is. It's physical diseases. Physical sicknesses. Amen. Well, if you look at 1 Peter 2, 24, you look at Isaiah 53, 3, 4, 5, you find out that Psalm 103, when it talks about healing, healing and forgiveness, they're found in all those same passages. Amen. I said amen. Why? Because Jesus bore your sicknesses at the same time he bore your sin. He bore your sin in his spirit. He bore your sickness in his body. Glory to God. One's physical, one's spiritual. Now, I'm, I'm going to make this statement. Don't, don't, don't get confused. Sickness is a result of sin. Now, it doesn't mean that you have sinned. Sickness is in the earth because man sinned. Mankind sinned. Adam sinned. You don't, that doesn't automatically equate to the fact that because you, you know, the common cold came by and you, you woke up sniffling with a fever or whatever, you, you committed some kind of sin. No, your body's out here in a fallen world. There's, there's diseases running around. There's things happening. You've got to use your faith to win. That's right. Amen. But it's the only reason it's in the earth is because of sin. In other words, it came into the earth and, and gained, it gained operation in man's bodies because of sin. Now, you can't just run around and, and lay a blanket. Somebody comes in with sniffling. You go, oh, they sinned. They got sin in their life because they're sick. No. Sickness is in the earth because of sin, but because someone's sick doesn't mean they sinned. Do you get that? Amen. All right? Just make that clear. I don't, you know, I don't want you to get confused on that, but at the same time, we understand that sickness is a result of, 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 of man's sin in the beginning. And it got into the earth. And Satan became the god of this world. And he's out to destroy anything he can of God's. He perverts everything he can pervert. He's perverting the marriage relationship and the homosexuality and bestiality and, you know, lesbianism and all this crazy, whacked out stuff. Perverts prosperity into poverty. To perverts health into sickness. Takes things that God intended for beauty and for blessing and turns them into to, to lust and sinfulness. Y'all hear you're going home. All right. Would y'all get anything out of this? All right. Well, right. if you're here tonight, you need to lay hands on you. We're going to minister to you by laying on of hands for, for what, any, anything you've got going on in your life. Now, let me say this. When you come tonight, Brother Dick, if you come and start playing for me just a little bit, we're, we're not going to take long. Um, but I want you, before you come, right here in your seat, say, when hands laid on me, I believe that I receive that the healing, that, that, I, that I am the healed of the Lord. I receive my healing as soon as hands laid on me in Jesus' name. 
Well, I was just hoping you'd do it for me. I can't, I can't do it for you. Put your faith out there. Yeah. Now, if you need to usually lay hands when you come at this time, come on. Yeah. But, as you're coming, thank you, Brother Dick. Did you need, did you need ministry? Or are you just, you ready to? No. All right. Hallelujah. Rest of you, stand up. Stretch your legs. Stretch your hands out to them. Hallelujah. Get your faith involved. I don't know how to get my faith involved. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Don't pray. Dear God, help them if you can. I want to move them down so we don't have to deal with the flower. You know, we need, we need, a, we need a flower arrangement fixer or something. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now while you're up here, just, just lift, lift your hand, close your eyes and say, Dear Father, I come tonight. I believe that the Word of God says they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So tonight, when Pastor Ed lays hands on me, I believe that I'm healed. In Jesus' name, I believe I receive it. It's mine now. I take it in the, name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I lay my hands upon you. And I speak life over your body. I command you to be made whole from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. In Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, I lay my hands on you. And I speak life and health and healing into your body. I command you to be made every whit whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. In Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, I lay my hands upon you. And I speak life over your body. And I command you to be healed from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And made every whit whole in Jesus' name. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, I lay my hands on you. And I thank you, that Father, that she's healed from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. And made every whit whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now say, I believe the hands were laid on me in the name of Jesus, and I'm healed according to the Word of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I lay my hands on you, the, uh, the Jesus, the head of the church. And I command you to be made every bit whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. You got a handkerchief? Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, I thank you that Acts chapter 19, verse 12 says, or is it 1219? Remember, y'all remember? <laughs> huh? 1912. That, that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Inasmuch as handkerchiefs were, and aprons were brought on him, and the diseases were laid on the sick, and they, were, they departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. I lay my hands on this, this cloth right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that it's just laid on the person in accordance with Acts 19.12 that the power of God will go out and go into their body. They'll be, made healed from the, they'll be healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.